Good evening, welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome Catherine Rundle to our At Home with Literati series this evening in support of Super Infinite and in conversation this evening with Rami Targoff. Uh, just a quick webinar overview for our attendees. The chat is closed, but you can keep the chat window open. I'll be uh, sharing links to purchase Super Infinite, The Transformations of John Donne from our bookstore throughout the event. And uh, you can interact with us at any time using the Q&A that's available to you at the bottom of your screen. So whenever you have a question, please feel free to submit your question there. Live transcription is also available to you using the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. If you're watching us later on YouTube, there are always links to purchase books in the description directly below me. You can also click on the little typewriter uh, icon at the bottom of your screen as well to subscribe to our channel and be kept up to date with all of our at home with literati events once they become available on our channel. And as a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan or the Ann Arbor area, of course, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. But most of all, we would just like to thank you for your attendance this evening uh, or this afternoon, much later this evening, I believe, in Catherine's case, uh, or this morning, uh, depending on when and where in the world you may be joining us. So without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's author and our interlocutor. Catherine Rundell is a fellow of All Souls College, Oxford. Her best-selling books for children have been translated into more than 30 languages and have won multiple awards. Rundell is also the author of a book for adults, Why You Should Read Children's Books Even Though You Are So Old and Wise, and writes occasionally for the London Review of Books, the Times Literary Supplement, and the New York Times. Speaking with her this evening, Remy Targoff is the Jehuda Reinhardt's Professor of the Humanities, Professor of English, and Co-Chair of Italian Studies at Brandeis University, where she has been teaching since 2001. She is the author of Common Prayer, Language and Devotion in Early Modern England, John Donne, Body and Soul, and Posthumous Love, Eros, and the Afterlife in Renaissance England, all from University of Chicago Press, and Renaissance Woman, The Life of Vittoria Colonna, from FSG. Targoff is the recipient of fellowships from the John Simon Guggenheim Fe Memorial Foundation, the American Council of Learned Societies, and she has been a scholar in residence at the American Academy in Rome. Her latest projects, Shakespeare's Sisters, a group biography of four women writers and Renaissance England will be published in 2023. Please join me in welcoming to your living rooms, Catherine Rundle and Rami Targoff. Thank you, John, and I'll get started. Um, Catherine or Kate, I think you go by, is that right? Uh, okay. It's lovely to be in conversation with you and welcome to everyone listening now and, and possibly later. Um, I thought we could just start by you're telling us how you came to write this book, how you uh, decided to shift from writing children's books to this. And maybe also just, I'm curious about the, as a writer for you, what the challenges were to to shift your voice, which I imagine you must have done, although you're, you're, for anyone who's read any of the book, the book is so lively and so kind of full of energy that I, I have a feeling it benefited from the, the children's uh, writing that you've done. But I, I, if you could just tell us a little bit about the story of the book. Um, I've loved John Donne since I was a very young child. Um, my parents used to pay us to memorize poetry that they would put up by the bathroom sink when we were little. And it was sort of the easiest form of capitalism available to us. So uh, we used to memorize quite a lot of poetry. Um, I should say in defense of my parents, not the really scurrilous John Donne sex poetry, the, the, the romances and the sort, of, the sort of things like go and catch a falling star. Um, which have, of course, their misogynistic sting yes, to them. Uh, um, but, you know, if you're a small child, uh, yes. have a vivid imagery that will carry you through. Um, and then when I was 21, I was made a fellow of All Souls College in Oxford and did a PhD there. And while I was writing my PhD, I was also writing a children's book and then another children's book. And I think I wanted to see if there would be a way that you can bring some of the kind of um, imaginative freedom that you have as a novelist to my great academic passion. I, I've loved John Donne so wildly. He does strike me as 
unlike any other writer, I think he expresses something with, not just with clarity, but with a kind of energy that comes from being a pure original. I think they have fire in them. And those poems, which are about desire, I think by acknowledging both sort of human frailty, spite, uh, strangeness, but also idealism, passion, joy, they bring to collide between them some of the truest and rawest human emotions. And I've loved him ever since I was little. And then, you know, when in adulthood, realizing there's no one really like him. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's really interesting. The, the famous, you know, account of Don as a great metaphysical poet, which we all studied in school, and the idea, as T.S. Eliot says, you know, that, that to him, you know, the smell of a rose was, was, he felt it, it was an experience, right, that it's alive. That's such a hard thing to, to talk about, but you do it really well in your book. And one way that you do it, I think, is to, um, is your, your enthusiasm, your honesty about what it feels like to read Dunn's poems, which is, I think, really hard to capture. I don't know if you found that, but it's, um, it's a hard thing to explain why these poems are, as you say, you know, so exciting and so innovative and so forth. Maybe just to get us get us started, you could you could read one that you think is particularly symptomatic of the things that you talk about, or read part of one. Of course. So in fact, maybe instead of reading a whole poem, I'll start just by. Um, so there are many, many duns, and one of the versions of Dunn, of course, that we all know is the rake who writes about the sort of very vivid, wild images of um, of sex. And I think one of the reasons that one of the cases that the book tries to make is this idea that Dunn offers us in his poetry of desire, a gift unlike almost any other writer because he uses imagery that embraces the peculiarity, the unwieldiness, the oddness of, of sexual desire. So while all the other men of the time were writing, um, you know, my lady is a perfect dove kind of poetry, you know, Walter Riley, not a man afraid to rhyme love and dove. And um, uh, Philip Sidney compares uh, his lady loves shoulders to two white doves. And then another poem, her cheeks are two white doves. And you do start to sort of feel like, you know, other birds are available. Um, but then um, Dunn refuses to play that game. And I think that is one of the reasons that his poetry has survived, that he reaches for stranger and therefore more memorable images. And of course, one of the most famous ones that you study here in England at A-level is um, the flea. And it starts, um, mark but this flea, and mark in this how little that which thou deniest me is. Me it sucked first, and now sucks thee, and in this blood our two bloods mingled be. The idea that when you wanted to talk about erotic desire, you would reach for a flea, which at the end of the poem, which is a narrative poem, the girl crushes between her fingers, it felt so vivid. And then of course, as I say in the book, and as you know, uh, when John Dunn Jr., his son came to publish the poetry, he used the, um, the long S, which looks in typography like an F, in a very deliberate sort of sly wink to the licentious reputation of his, of his father. So me, it sucked first and now sucks the, had a, like a very, another more vivid reading that one could have. Um, and I love that version of Dunn, the kind of ribald and inventive version. Yes, I mean, one thing, among the many, many things that's so exciting about a poem like that is watching Dunn change his mind, or not change his mind, but think on his feet, right? As she, as she you know, kills the, the play and, and, you know, I mean, each, each stanza of a Dunn poem takes a different position as if you're really watching something happen before your eyes as opposed to a kind of very formal sonnet that that's fixed and I think that you bring that out you bring that out so well I feel I feel that um you're in you don't I, maybe you do mention Samuel Johnson once I'm not actually sure if I remember you did but I feel you're you're um responding to and 
and kind of defending Dunn against Johnson, who thought that everything you just described was totally disgusting. And <laughs> that the idea that you would describe an eternal love as a bracelet of bright hair about the bone and so forth. And I'm wondering how much you were actively kind of fighting against the idea that there was something really, you know, ghastly about all of this. <laughs> exactly that. So the fact that John Donne has been so calumniated and attacked by so many critics of his own period, like Johnson, you know, famously done for not keeping his accent deserved hanging. But then Johnson Dryden, who said, um, though they may be better wits, yet we are better poets. Yes. Um, but then I think it, it is exactly that. The book is in part as it, it admits to being a kind of act of evangelism. And of course, as you know, there is so much poetry that would also meet a different version of desire for all the kind of wild ribaldry and all the poems which are comparing a woman's tongue to a remora, which was both a real sucking fish and also a mythic one that ate ships. Um, yeah. There's also, you know, there's love's growth and you know, love's growth begins. Um, I scarce believe my love to be so pure as I had thought it was because it doth endure vicissitude and season as the grass. Methinks I lied all winter when I swore my love was infinite if spring make it more. And of course, as we know okay. that more is a, is a play on his wife's name and more. Yes. If, if one is wanting a cavalcade of romance, it's there for you. Yes. Yes. It's a gorgeous, it's a gorgeous poem. And, and uh, he plays with his name and her name in so many different ways as you, as you talk about in, in, in the book. Before we leave the love poetry, because as you said before, Dunn is most famous to most people as a love poet, but he was so many things. And the subtitle of your book is the transformations of John Donne. And I wanna talk about those transformations, but I feel given, given all the kinds of conversations we've been having in the last decade, um, I feel it would be remiss not to talk about the, the negative side of the love poems a little bit and how you, how you deal with that. And I don't know if you've ever read an essay that, that I have thought a lot about um, by Christopher Ricks called Done After Love. Did you ever read that essay? The, the argument of that is that Dunn ruins all his poems and he starts brilliantly as you just showed us, but he ends badly. And Rick's in a pretty daring move for the 1980s or 70s, whenever he wrote that, said he does that because he hates coming. He hates the post coital. He doesn't like the climax. He's, he's all on fire undressing his mistress, but until he gets to that point, And then that's why that poem is so successful because to his mistress going to bed, because we don't see the other side, the but that yeah. John is terrified about sexual climax. And he, he's a great literary critic. So he makes a pretty convincing point for that. But that's just one way to explain something that's always made me so uncomfortable with Dunn, whom I share the first poem I ever memorized as a child with somehow or other, Death Be Not Proud. But you know, I also grew up memorizing Dunn. And yet as women, as feminists, as people attuned to all of these things, what do you, how do you, how do you make sense of that? How does that reconcile with the, with the poet you love so much? I mean, it is the great problem, isn't it? To be a woman who loves Dunn and to also yeah. read poems where it is describing a woman's body as a kind of menstruous boil. And, you know, the, the, the vividness of the distaste at the female body and at the female presence sometimes is, is too vivid to be written off as just indicative of the time. So yeah. I think there are sort of two things. There's the one where we have to sort of bring our entire armory of nuance against reading someone by the, the you know, uh, social and moral structures of our moment. Like, of course, the past is another country, of course. But Dunn wasn't just participating in common or garden misogyny. His misogyny was more vicious, more vivid, more cruel. And I think one of the ways that you can of course think about it is to question who is speaking in these poems so you know when i when i used to teach at oxford i would say you know done is not always the i like the very basic beginning um yeah. and a lot of his most misogynistic writing is actually in the prose pieces in the paradoxes and problems one of which where he sort of casts into question the idea of whether or not women have souls but of course 
the problems and the paradoxes were existing in an academic tradition of putting very extreme impossible arguments as a bid to kind of um, prove their opposite sometimes, but then also sometimes not prove their opposite. Like the, um, the question of what exactly is happening in the, in the problems and paradoxes is I think still very much debated by scholars today. Um, but the way I tend to think of it is this, um, although I love the Ricks, I love the Ricks essay. Uh, I, it's, not, it's, not, it's not my personal reading, but I do find it a brilliant, and as you say, incredibly bold piece of writing. Yeah. Um, I think that it was part of him. I think that in amongst his kind of joyful reckoning with his desire, joyful reckoning with women, um, because of course, the sun rising doesn't end with a kind of uh, post-coital horror um, and neither does love's growth or the ecstasy. Um, so there are poems which are close to a kind of sense of woman or rather desire and love, fulfilled love as miraculous. But there is also the cruel and barbed version of him. And I think it was just part of his intellectual makeup that he had this corner of his heart that was furious and part of that fury was leveled at women but I would love to know how do you how do you teach when you're teaching your students what do you what do you offer them as a way to process it I mean it's it's a really good question and in some respects it's become more difficult to teach done lately because his disregard for the at moments for for the female intellect and the female body is hard to kind of <laughs> reconcile. Um, but, you know, I like to think about, for example, comparing Dunn to Shakespeare, who has the nastiest things to say about women in Troilus and Cressida, in Othello, but we don't read that as Shakespeare being a misogynist because the advantage of being a playwright is you're creating all of these people. And that connects to what you said that, you know, about the eye and the poetic eye and, and, how, you know, all the evidence, as you make wonderfully clear, and I want to talk about his marriage, is that Dunn was actually a monogamous, uh, devoted husband. And so that that's a kind of jarring thing. I mean, whereas Shakespeare, you know, clearly didn't care much about Anne Hathaway. And this isn't to cast aspersions on, on, on Shakespeare. But I do think, I mean, I try not to psychoanalyze any of the authors who I haven't met in person or anyone in general since I'm not trained. But I do think that what Ricks is getting at is an interesting phenomenon that Dunn is just so full of energy and excitement um, heading in. And then he has a lot like Benedict and Much Ado, who on some respects is one of the most glorious um, male figures Shakespeare created, but he's filled with just gratuitous nastiness. And you know, because I am personally Jewish and I'm more sensitive to anti-Semitism and some of Dunn, you know, I, it's the same problem there. Like Dunn just makes nasty comments about Jews all the time, as Trollope does, as, you know, and and one, one needs to include that in the story, I mean, is what I want to say. I mean, I don't excuse it, but I also don't think it defines him. Does that, does that correspond to what you think? Exactly that, that that to sort of pretend it doesn't exist would be to boo both your audience, your students, anyone reading a book, and Dunn himself a huge disservice because, because it's one of the defining characters of some of Dunn's verse. Uh, you know, we call it the anti-woman verse. But, but to think that it is the leading thing, the yeah. only thing, seems to me to be losing so much that is absolutely remarkable. It is part of who he was. Um, and of course, the other thing is when you try to imagine the moment in which he was writing that verse, I think it becomes doubly interesting when you think of him writing a lot of the, the, the misogynistic verse um, in that sort of merry-go-round of, um, of sort of papery exchange that these young men at the inns of court yes, and then later yes. in London would have had, that he was writing for a very small number of boys he knew very well. Yes. And he knew that he was the best of them. And he was increasingly becoming well-known even when he was quite young um, in just those small circles. 
because they would have been written the same kind of work, you know, for every pose of the Lord, sort of lovelorn, devoted lover, there would have been the, the wayward rake and the boy who doesn't care about the girls that he slays. It would have been so much a performance among peers and so much less a kind of solitary statement of intent in the way that in a sort of post-romantic reading of poetry, I think we have started to take the lyric eye. Yeah. I think that's absolutely right. You know, Helen Gardner, one of the great Dunn critics, the grand Dunn critic of the 20th century, said Dunn was the greatest poet ever of mutual love, you know, of reciprocity and love. And when you when you think about the long tradition in which he was writing, you know, starting with Petrarch and through Sidney and so, you know, there was never reciprocity in any of those. I mean, when when Laura's dead, you know, she's... <laughs> It gives Patrick a little bit of a little bit of attention, but you know there is just something you know so satisfying. I think about the poems that really work: the valedictions, you know, the ecstasy, love's growth, and so forth. The anniversary; um, those poems are like not, none others, I think. But let, let's put Dunn's love poetry aside for a minute, because as I say, it has a way of dominating. But in fact, as as the book points out so well, it was really just a very small part of his career. And I wonder if we could talk a little bit about his vocation and how you understand what happened to him. It's such an extraordinary story. And I don't know if everyone um, listening knows it, but maybe you could just explain how he became, you know, so the classic account of Don, as the, uh, which Don created himself as, you know, this bifurcated life of Jack Don versus John Don, the rake versus the, the priest is so much more complicated than that. And, and you do a brilliant job of bringing out that complexity. So maybe you could just share with our listeners a little bit about that story. So it is the sort of, the, the great debate of Dunn's scholarship is how far was John Dunn's religious conversion and religious ambition genuine and how far was it expedient? Because, of course, John Donne, born in 1572, was born a Catholic to a family related to Thomas More. And at some point in his life, he converted to Protestantism. And we don't know when. The thing that everyone says famously is that um, probably when he was at the Inns of Court, uh, he was probably a Catholic. Um, certainly he was at university when he was just a very young child at university, sort of 12, 13. Um, and that by the time he got married, he was a Protestant. And we don't know what happened there. And of course, so for instance, in the 80s, uh, one of the great, great pieces of John Donne scholarship is John Carey's John Donne, Life, Mind and Art, in which he essentially argues that John Donne's conversion was that he held a finger to the wind, realized that someone with his sort of startling brilliance of mind would find no place to put that brilliance at the Catholic. And so his conversion, and then later his taking of orders and becoming eventually the Dean of St. Paul's was a piece of ambition, um, a way of unleashing his brilliance on the world in a way that he would not have been able to do as a Catholic at a time when, and of course I'm sure everyone listening knows, um, it was illegal to be a Catholic. You could be fined for not attending church and the uh, penalty for being a Catholic priest was often to be hung, drawn and courted, uh, a, a uniquely horrible way to die. And so was it fear? Was it expediency? The book, my book believes that it was probably much more nuanced than that and that perhaps some of those views didn't give him enough credit for not just the kind of slow transformation of anyone's attitude, you know, um, being in love with Protestants, being friends with Protestants, potentially the desire to move to a kind of national pride which required adhering to Elizabeth and then James as the head of the church and the head of the nation. But also conversion is possible and his may have been real. And um, one of the things that's really interesting recently that one of my friends, Daniel Starzer Smith, who works on the Letters Project, um, was, uh, was discussing quite recently was the letters. We have recently been able to date some of the letters in a new way that show that he was writing, trying to get a position um, as a priest for at least about a year and three months, maybe a year and a half, 
and he was being blocked at every turn um, by Buckingham. And so this, this sense that he just sort of took the easy way out, I'm not sure that that's what it was. And if you read the sermons, they do not read like the work of someone taking the easy way out. Even if you acknowledge some form of like, yes, he must have realized that, that it would be better and easier to be a Protestant. But some of that work just strikes me as the work of someone wholeheartedly devoting the full force of their burning intellect to their prose. What do you think? I'd love to know your stance um, on this one. Well, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think I think you make a really compelling case in the book for his for not not reducing him to a kind of opportunistic Protestant. I think it was really hard to be Catholic in uh, Elizabethan and Jacobean England. And I think we have to take that also very seriously. I mean, this wasn't this wasn't a kind of easy position to be in. He saw lots of suffering in his own family. I think it's also startling and I really hadn't done the math recently um when you point out that how old was he when he finally became a priest was he 40 40 yeah, 40 42 40 40 40 I always forget the yeah anyway, but he was in his 40s he was not a young man I mean far from and as you point out from our best estimates life expectancy for someone who lived through infancy was 56 so he Talk about a late stage career. I mean, this was not something that happened young. And therefore, it's also just so interesting to think of how much time passed before that, you know, and the struggle. And and so, I mean, I've never experienced anything like done sermons in terms of feeling someone's conviction. But I also think, you know, there's a letter. I don't think you quote this letter in the book, but I'm sure you've read it where he's writing to, <laughs> to Goodyear, his, his, you know, his Tuesday uh, companion, uh, as, as you point out, I've, I've always found that so endearing that he wrote to him every Tuesday. There is just something lovely about that. And I want to talk more about those letters. But there's an amazingly interesting letter about conversion, where Goodyear is actually, I think, considering converting to Catholicism or the hedges. And Dunn says, you know, when you look at a Roman coin, and the face of one emperor has been scratched out, and another one put on top, you know, Nero's replacing Caligula or whatever. He says, but if you hold it a certain light and you look at it, and his phrase is awry and squint. If you look at it awry and squint, you always see what's behind it. And he says, that's what it means to convert, that you can't ever get rid of that layer of Catholicism or Protestantism, whichever way you're going, that you're always both things. And I do think, however profoundly Protestant done is, there's, I think one of the things that makes his sermon so gripping is, you know, his refusal to let go of a certain kind of Catholic imagery, a Catholic set of obsessions. I don't know if that was your experience reading it, but I think that um, one feels the Catholicism isn't gone is what I would say. Yeah. For I'm, the better, I'm, for the better. Yeah, it, exactly. The, the, some of the sort of the rhythms of Catholic text, some of the rhythms of, of that way of thinking, some of the vividness of Catholic imagery, it's still there in his sermons. And I think we, as you say, it gives him a kind of power, a kind of vividness. Um, you know, some of the traditions of Catholic preaching are very much in, in his texts, I think. Yes. Um, and it is, it is really remarkable. I, I, I know and, and love that, that letter in that the idea that it just, you know, sort of palimpsestically, no matter what you do, there yes. will always be anything as deep bound as religion, especially religion, you know, as you say, religion at that point, to be a Catholic, it would have just taken up so much of your imagination and so much of your adrenaline to be living as a Catholic in Elizabethan England. It would have been an overwhelming thing to give up. And there's no way that it, even no matter how profound the conversion, it would have still been in his fingertips. Tell us a little bit, because one of the many wonderful things about your book is that you bring the marriage um, more to the fore, I think, than most accounts have done. And you talk wonderfully about Anne's gas. I mean, <laughs> poor Anne uh, gave birth to 12 children in 14 years or whatever it was. Um, but also just what it meant for Don to be, you know, kind of stuck. I mean, just just what a complicated 
emotional predicament the marriage turned out to be. And, you know, there's that one letter, I don't know if you have it handy, where he's describing that, I think, to Goodyear. Um, maybe you could just read a little bit. Of, I love that letter. I don't, I don't remember exactly where in your book it is, but I, I'm sure you know. Um, so if I will, I will very briefly, um, if I, I'll briefly explain what happened. So, um, so John Dunn, um, in his uh, 20s, is employed by a man called Sir Thomas Edgerton, who was Keeper of the Great Seal, who was one of the most important men in legal London. And he has staying with him his niece, 14 year old Anne Moore. And we know almost nothing about her, um, but we do know that at some point over those three years, they fell in love. And he wrote then or soon after some of his most ravishing love poetry to her. And although we don't know, um, there never, there's no, we have so little in John Donne's hand and there's no sort of little note saying for Anne, but we know because of the more, because of the pun on if spring makes it more, um, and you know, that cures all with more. Um, so at some point, uh, he convinced her to marry him. There are some who think that perhaps she was pregnant, although there was no child nine months later. Um, they married secretly uh, in the winter, and then they appeared to have had no definite plan and they just went home separately to wait and see what would happen. And in the end, they could wait no longer. So he wrote um, via a, a mission, a, a, an intermediary, a letter telling um, Anne's father what he'd done. And we all think basically by reading the letters, we can gauge that he knew that George Moore, Anne's dad, would be furious, but he didn't know how dramatically life-changingly, life-upendingly, life-destroyingly furious he would be. So Don was thrown immediately into jail. And it and wasn't just even- Just to interrupt bad. you for a second, Captain, explain to everybody, why was this such a bad marriage? I mean, he was, a, you know, in many ways, a promising young courtier with great intellect. Why do you think it provoked the reaction? What kind of a marriage could she have made, do you think? Right. So we have a little bit of evidence of some of her, for instance, her in-laws marrying uh, men right. with titles and great estates. She was higher born than him. And um, she came from a beautiful place, Lossley Park, a, a majestic, um, fairly yeah. small grounds, but like a, a, a truly glorious spot. The Duns had very little money. The Catholics had, at one point, had... Um, a certain amount of, of land and power, but it had all been lost in the various shakedowns of Catholics over the last hundred years. So Dunn had basically run through most of his money. Um, he had a position that would have been quite close to Anne's um, uncle, Thomas Edgerton, but he also possibly would have had a little bit of a reputation as, as this sort of writer of rakish poetry. Right, and, right. and quite crucially, his brother, one of the great tragedies of his life had happened a, a few years before, where when they were together at the Inns of Court learning to be lawyers, his younger brother, Henry, who was 19, was found to have harbored a priest in his rooms. And the priest was hung, drawn and quartered. And Henry himself was thrown into jail and plague was running through the jail. And very swiftly, we think, as far as we can tell, again, reading between the lines and letters, before Dunn visited him, Henry died horribly and alone in jail. And so Dunn was the brother of a boy who had been arrested for harboring a priest, was the son of a woman who had been in trouble with the authorities. His mother, who seems to have had quite a vivid personality, had been uh, fined for not attending church services. He was a very difficult sort of liminal character for all his undoubted brilliance. And he probably, we think, I was talking to Dan Starzer Smith about this, he probably will have had the kind of the feel of a little bit of a literary celebrity among her circle. People will have known that he was the writer of something great, but he was not a good prospect in any way <laughs> for a man who wanted to shield his daughter from privation and set her up well in the way that Dunn himself later did with his own daughters. Um, and so when they got married in secret, 
they were doing something quite dramatic. The book talks about other instances where young women going against their father's will were sort of beaten about the head until they bled. Some of them were disowned. She took a great startling leap of courage and faith when she married Dunn. Yeah. And then the difficulty is it didn't go well. She married the greatest love poet in the English language and he seems to have continued to adore her but adoration isn't always enough. And when he finally got out of jail, they had no money, he was sacked, he had no job. And for years later, they were sort of trying to pin together a life with various small jobs, various writings by Dunn in prose for the king. But they didn't manage any kind of great swell back to prominence socially. And I think one of the things to think about is, for Anne, she was 17 and she would have been yeah. one of the darlings of, of fashionable London. So she would have been courted and there would have been boys dancing with her at balls. And then suddenly she had no money and she would have been the subject of gossip and angry gossip and kind of despising gossip. And then they went to live with her cousin because they had nowhere else to go, which was I think very difficult. And then they went to a series of houses which Dunn describes in this kind of the sort of cold of the one of the cellars has vapors rising and and you know he calls them his <laughs> so they just sound ghastly although um i did one interview where someone was like so he lived in squalor and i want to be like no no not squalor no he, they yeah. middle class but not rich um and there's this wonderful letter exactly um so there's this letter uh, that he writes to good ear his one of his best best friends um when he has a few children, they come swiftly, the children. Anne is pregnant or recovering from pregnancy for the, every year of her adult life. She has 12 children, two of whom are stillborn and another four of whom die um, through, uh, before they are reach adulthood. So this is one of the letters he wrote. I write to you, not out of my poor library, where to cast my, Sorry, <laughs> I write not to you out of my poor library, where to cast mine eyes upon good authors, kindles or refreshes, sometimes meditations not unfit to communicate to near friends, nor from the highway, where I contracted and inverted into myself, which are my two ordinary forges of letters to you. I love that, the idea that he mostly thinks about Henry and the letters he's going to send him on his horse. Yes. But I write from the fireside in my parlour and in the noise of three gamesome children, and by the side of her, whom because I have transplanted into a wretched fortune, I must labor to disguise that from her all such honest devices of giving her my company and discourse. Therefore, I steal from her all the time which I give this letter, and it is therefore that I gallop so fast over it. It's such a it's vivid amazing. image. Amazing. I mean, just the emotional complexity and intelligence of that letter, and that gets to something that you talk about, and it's it's really hard um, to read done. It's really hard work. It's a lot of work. These poems are not transparent. That letter is so complicated rhetorically, and it's convoluted, and you and I could sit down and unpack it. But what do you think about, I mean, you say your book is both a biography and an act of evangelism, and how do we get people back to reading done? Because it's not, it's not easy. It's not a sort of pre-packaged. I mean, the pleasure of it is, I think you say, is like unpacking the most complicated thing. And then it, it just gushes you with so much reward. But what do you think about the best strategy or how do you imagine? Your book is certainly one, one, but you know, I know that Don was the darling of the new critics precisely because he was so hard. And that you could just drop a poem on your desk and it's like reading, you know, scripture with, you know, just tons of work. But do you think that's that's one of the reasons people aren't reading done? Um, is that is that in our way? And, and do you have any thoughts about what would be a good a good plan to get him back into people's libraries and hands? I do. I mean, I, I so deeply agree. He is difficult. And it does mean that at the moment he is not, I don't think he's fallen out in quite the same way that he did in perhaps, you know, like the, the early 19th century, but right. um, he is so hard to persuade people to read. 
because he cannot really just be read once. He isn't a poet who, if you read it through, you immediately get a sort of burst of delight, like someone like, I don't know, um, Wordsworth or, or Heaney or even some of the great modern poets like Nick Laird. But um, I think one thing that is always worth remembering, so two things, one of them is Dunn's difficulty was heralded at the time. People knew that he was difficult then. So it's not just a, uh, a result of the, the 400 years that have passed. He did it on purpose. And the question of why he did it, I think is such an interesting one. He, that very famous quote that we all cite where he says, I sing not siren-like for I am harsh. He has a kind of sense of himself as being resistant and ornery. And I think so much of it is because he is making an implicit, constant, relentless request for your attention and for the full force of your human imagination, for, for you to offer his poetry and also to offer all your intellectual endeavors, all your human endeavors, the full vivid attention that you can give it. And I think attention is something that the poems are so invested in. They, they are so often in their originality demanding your attention. And in one of his um, sermons that he wrote when he was, uh, I think about five years before he died, um, he writes, uh, he's imagining Newgate would be the prison and Tyburn would be where you would go to be hung as a criminal. And he writes, now was there ever, ever man seen to sleep in the cart between Newgate and Tyburn, between the prison and the place of execution, does any man sleep? And yet we sleep all the way from the womb to the grave. We are never thoroughly awake. And I think that awake is so much part of Dunn's desire for his readers, for his, those listening to his sermons, for the smaller group of people reading his verse. He, he is so aware that if you can jolt someone out of some kind of... Um, uh, inarticulate complacency you can you can shock them into into a into a form of living that would be a greater salute to what it is to be human because I think John's work is so brilliant in its understanding of that alchemic mix of humanity the 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 great joy of being alive the the sort of thrill of being a great thinker, the sense that thinking fast and hard is a kind of sensual pleasure in itself, the pleasure of, of the body and of sex and of sort of the intertwining of bodies that he describes so beautifully. But then also he was a man who knew such dread, not just losing Henry, but those six babies. And then Anne died in childbirth when she was in her very early thirties. And yet he still keeps insisting, despite the fact that we know he was constantly in pain, suicidal, he was the author of the first full length treatise on suicide in the English language. He still says to compare a man unto a world would be a mistake because compared to a man, the world itself is just a dwarf, he says, you know, that the world is, the, other than God, a man is greater than the world, his sense of our infinity. And so I think if we could coax people into reading Dunn because it offers something so true and intricate about humanity. Um, and also that it's a kind of bulwark, a bulwark against the sense that life should be easy. I love him for insisting that it's not. Yeah. What about you? How do you think we can lure that, people? That was beautiful. Everything you just said was beautiful. I'm mindful, let, let me, I, I'm happy to answer that, but let me just ask John, do you want to, um, you said you wanted to turn to some questions now, and I don't know if we have questions from the audience. We don't um, have questions from the audience just yet. Of course, viewers are welcome to, they're perhaps as wrapped as uh, I am, but they're welcome to submit their questions using the the Q&A feature, and I'll, I'll read a selection of those questions uh, as they come in. But maybe I'm ha happy to hear your, your answer to that question as well. <laughs> I'm trying to avoid answering this incredibly difficult <laughs> question. Um, you know, I mean, I I I think that um the the rewards of reading Don, I mean, that you you get what you put into things, and the rewards of reading Don 
are are immense. I think that the feeling I, I, I often visually imagine like just walking into a Vermeer painting when I'm reading a Dunn poem that I'm just like in the room and there's an exchange of looks and I'm totally present and the sun is gleaming in from one angle and that the 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 capacity to to immerse oneself in whatever you know I mean Dunn you know begins poems by saying you know stand still you know I mean who does that I mean it's just an extraordinary thing I'm you know or one of my favorite moments in a Dunn sermon is when he's preaching about the resurrection and then he stops and can you imagine sitting in the congregation he says you're sitting here listening to me but you're not listening you're thinking I heard a better sermon on this topic last week or now when everyone's in church would have been a good time to go meet my mistress or whatever and he goes through this whole thing and and he's he's scolding but he's also so forgiving of the human condition and our foibles and our weaknesses um you know I just think there's something, I, I wrote my dissertation largely about Herbert and Don and the difference between them of someone who's, I mean, Herbert's a glorious poet, but he always knew that he was loved by God in his mind. He was always chosen. And just to see Don, who's just terrified um, for much of his life that he's not gonna make it in any number of ways. I think he, I think he's a wonderful companion. I mean, just a wonderful companion. But I do think the difficulty is 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 a real problem um, for our students. It's not a quick fix. Um, these are naughty poems, and to to unknot them is incredibly satisfying. But it's also it's also hard. I wonder if you could tell us about your title. That's something that you mentioned in the book. But I think it's such a fabulous title, and I hope you don't mind. My dog is desperate to hear you, so I'm opening the door to my dog. <laughs> Scratching away. Oh, what a dog. He's, he's Welsh, so he's sort of closer to the he wants his word dot. So he's now lying. Yep, there he goes. Okay. He heard people were talking about Don and he said he needed to, to come he's keen to join in. I mean, rightly yeah. so. But yeah, tell um, us about your title, which is such a fabulous word. And maybe in doing so, if you don't mind, just share with our audience a little bit Don's crazy capacity for neologisms for combining words in different ways, because this is a sort of example of that. So super infinite is one of Dunn's many, many coins. It's from a funeral sermon uh, preached for George Herbert's mother, Magdalene yeah. Herbert. In fact, he uses it in two other instances as well. And he loved the super prefix. So he loved adding super to words that other of us would not think needs super. So super miraculous, super eternal, super dying. He had this sense of needing to go beyond a place where words would usually take us. And I think therefore forces language to indicate that desire to, to sort of point to something beyond, beyond really comprehensional words. Um, and it is part of his sort of wild, hungry, exuberant, you know, sort of outrageous quality. Um, and he also was a great inventor of words. When poetry forms would not do as he wished, he broke them. When language would not meet his needs, he invented new ones. Um, the OED cites him for at least 300 new words, although of course, as you know, always a bit tricky with the OED because sometimes they may well have been words in common parlance that he's just the only person who survived or the first person who survived. Um, but you know, like fecundate, embrotheled, <laughs> apparently <laughs> um, You know, he was a man who, who faced with the need to develop a language that would experience, that would sort of express the unique quality of each human soul is sort of insisting, I think, make up your own language, you know, force language to meet the needs that you need it to meet, yes. rather than obeying the language rules that have been laid out by those who came before you. He has a kind of insistence on not just the value, but the necessity of originality. Um, he's very, very skeptical about those who copy, you know, famously in the satires when he says, um, you know, the worst of those who beggarly doth chore other wits fruits 
Um, yes. And, you know, this idea of sort of people like eating other people's um, uh, other people's ideas and sort of, and then, you know, like coming out of excrement. He is, he was someone who believed that, you know, to follow the own track of one's own original mind and find a way to express it was a necessity for him, I think. Yes. Yes, that's fabulous. Um, do we, do we, John? Are we still question less from the audience? I think so. I don't want to. I don't want to dominate. Um, no, we, not at all. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question from from you. We 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 have no questions yet from the audience, but we we only really have time for one more question. So if there's something, one last question we might like to ask, uh, the the floor is certainly yours. Oh, okay. Well, I I still have many different questions, but I guess. One question I wanted to ask you was, uh, have you read Gilead by Marilyn Robinson? It's my favorite novel. Well, second oh, favorite novel. Okay. Well, so that's great. You and I obviously have a lot of things in common. But um, when I read that novel, I felt in touch with um, what it meant for Don to write these sermons and what it meant for him. And I was, that happened, that would be my answer to the question I'm going to ask you. But, you know, where do you find Dunn resonating maybe in contemporary fiction or in other other authors? I mean, and you can talk about Gilead if that would be a good choice, but where do you see, I, I mean, when I read that, I, I kind of got something about Dunn that I hadn't understood before. And I don't know if there's any other experience you've had like that where something clicked in for you. I mean, utterly with Gilead. Um, I think some of his uh, kind of, um, sort of satirical bite mixed with generosity. Yes. Um, you will find it in in Marilyn Robinson and in my 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 most beloved writer in the world was Hilary Mantel until yes. she tragically yes. died five days ago. Yes. Um, and I was once I didn't know her well but we met a few times and oh. her one of her favorite poets was Dunn. Oh, and she wonderful. said it was because it, he said she said that dread that dread that he has, but that love. Yeah. And I think Mantel's work understands human dread and understands human love and also has the same kind of um, sense that like wit has its own power in itself as a life force. Um, so I think she is in some ways one of the heirs to Dunn. Um, and then of course the obvious ones like, you know, bit of E. Cummings, bit of T.S. Eliot. Yeah, no, but that's such a nice homage to her. And I do think, um, you know, her vision of Cromwell has some done in it, maybe. I don't know if that's the case, no. but I mean, that he has the kind of the mind, he's not a poet, but something about the sensibility uh, that she brings out. So thank you. That's wonderful. Well, that's the top of the hour here at At Home with Literati. Uh, Catherine Rundle, Rami Targoff, thank you so much for joining us this evening. You can, thank of course, you. purchase Super Infinite at the links in the chat. There's also links in the description below um, if you are watching us on YouTube. But hopefully we can have you both uh, in the store sometime in the not too distant future for your next books. Uh, but until then, we wish you well. And to all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at the next event. Have a great evening, all. Take care. Bye. Good night.